All right, folks, good morning. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get after it and talk a little bit about the biomechanics of the lower extremity. Um, see if anybody else shows up, because right now I'm just streaming to myself, but that's okay. So, first thing we're gonna start off with is going to be the hip socket. So what we've got there is going to be <coughs> the ball and socket joint that is made up of our acetabulum. So that's gonna be the part coming from our hip and then the head of the femur. Now, these, are incredibly stable because the acetabulum is pretty deep along with the femur head obviously is going to sit inside so unlike the shoulder we're not going to have as great of a range of motion ability naturally but we are going to be far less likely to dislocate and we're going to have a lot more stable force production because we also have pelvis which is made up of technically three separate bones that are effectively all fused together you do have some movement at the sacral iliac joint along with a little bit at the pubic synthesis. Now, the stability of that hip joint is even more so enhanced from the fact that we have a strong amount of cartilage on the outside. It has its own labrum. That's going to help hold that inside of the socket along with providing some lubrication so it's not going to grind and move a little bit easier. And once again, it is far deeper than the glenoid fossa of our shoulder joint. Now, the ligaments that are going across, we can see our iliofemoral ligament, our ischofemoral ligament, and then we have our pubofemoral ligament when we're looking at the anterior side. Now, notice how that iliofemoral or femoral ligament actually arches up and over. Now, all three of those are obviously doing a great job of helping keep that hip in the socket. Now, when we come on over and we look at the tension in these ligaments, are going to work in such a way so that's actually acting to twist the head of the femur into the acetabulum during extension. So that's whenever we're pushing our leg further behind us. Okay. So this is an example as we're standing up. It's literally help locking the hip inside the joint. Now, we then have what's known as bursa. Bursa are effectively fluid-filled uh, discs that are going to allow for our, uh, effectively a little bit more padding between our muscles and specifically our tendons around our bones. Now, this is a good thing because obviously it's gonna help cushion the forces that are being produced and received. However, like anything else, these are a point of failure that turns out on occasion people can burst their bursa sacs, and that is an incredibly uncomfortable endeavor to have to go through. Now, we then have our femur. Now, the femur is the longest bone and typically the strongest bone in the human body. Now, it does have a weak point, and that is the neck. So if we're thinking about our femur as the long straight bone, the neck and then the head are what's coming off the top. The neck is where it actually has its most structural issues. And so when people break their hip, it's actually typically breaking their femoral neck. That's also the bone that, or the part of the femur that Bo Jackson broke that then, because of the, pure, the poor vascularization of bones, once you're a fully formed adult, it then caused tissue necrosis and the death of effectively the head of the femur. So that's why he actually had to have a hip replacement as a guy who was only in his 20s. Now, the pelvic girdle, so that our entire hip bone is gonna be made up of our ilia and our sacrum. Now, we have our ilium, and which is gonna be the hip bone on the upper sides. We can feel that when we touch our sides. We then are going to have our pubis, and that's gonna be the bone you feel on the front of our hip. And then you have your sacrum, which is gonna be technically part of our spine and our vertebral column that is working or that's passing down through our body. Now, all three of these bones, once again, are effectively fused together. There's not gonna be the most amount of delineation. The key is just to understand that these are different components that when combined gives us the full effect that we have. But look, when we're seeing in this picture is A, how deep our acetabulum is. And then we can see through the pubis, the ischium, and then our iliac crest where we have a number of different muscles that are going to 
B inserting into, for example, our glutes and our hamstrings and our groins. Now, we are going to get, just like with scapular movement, with shoulder movement working together synergistically, we're going to find the same type of situation with the way that our pelvis is tilting and then how we're going to move. So when you think about our pelvis tilting forward, that is what's known as anterior pelvic tilt. When our pelvis tilts backwards, that's going to be what's known as posterior pelvic tilt. And then we can have lateral when we're moving to the side. So example, whenever I go and AB ducks to lift my leg up to the side, I'm also laterally tilting my pelvis. You can really see this when someone's doing uh, like a kick in karate. We then have the anterior, which is where we're going to be tilting ourselves forward so we can extend our leg behind us even more aggressively. And then we have posterior, so now that pelvis is leaning back, and that's going to allow us to lift that leg up a little bit more aggressively. Now, what is going to help us get that flexion, so that lifting that leg up, that's going to be our iliacus and our psoas. These are both deep muscles that go into our pelvis and actually our spine, which is a major point of flaw when it comes to uh, muscles and or origination, in that if you have really tight hip flexors, specifically your psoas, it's literally going all the way into your lumbar spine, and if it's tight, it's constantly pulling your lumbar spine forward, which is exerting a shear stress, which is obviously causing or potential cause of pain. Now, we then have our rectus femoris, that's that center muscle of our quadricep that's gonna help lift our leg. We have our tensor fascia lati, which is on the outside. You can feel that when you lift your leg, it's that little ball that's gonna sit right off the hip in front of the iliac crest. And then our pectineus and sartorius are very, very small movers. The major four is our iliacus or psoas, and then our rectus femoris and our tensor fascia lati. Now, like anything else, muscles only pull with a line of, or can only shorten. So they're just gonna pull from their origin insertion and bring on forward. Our sartorius actually is gonna help lift our leg and internally rotate it. But the key is, once again, with those tight hip flexors, it can be something that potentially causes kinetic issues with causing back pain. And so, hence, making sure that you stretch out your hip flexors, maintain their tissue length is very important. And what's really problematic is sitting naturally tightens up our hip flexors because we're literally spending time in that flex state and muscles are always going to adapt to the range of motion that they're demanded to go through. So here we have an actual anatomical example where we can see the ileus, we can see the psoas major, and then we can see the rectus femoris and how they are all gonna be contributing to lifting that leg in front of us. Here's the sartorius, uh, sometimes it's referred to, I believe as the like the cobbler muscle, and that if you're thinking about trying to get yourself into a, um, oh gosh, we'd be kind of getting into the eagle pose if we're talking about yoga because I'm so good at it, but what that's going to go ahead and do is not just assist in hip flexion, but once again, give you that rotation. You can see how that's going to naturally occur since it's literally going to be attaching into our iliac in the anterior portion and then into the medial aspect of the tibia. So if it shortens, it's not just going to lift, but it's going to pull the two in that angle. We then have our extensor muscles. So these are going to be the muscles that are going to extend our hip behind us. The major mover is going to be your glute maximus. Now that is obviously a massive muscle that's literally, it should be the thickest muscle on the human body. Emphasis on the word, word should be. The problem is since literally a lot of people spend a lot of time sitting on their butts, they get what's referred to as gluteal amnesia, aka they forget how to use their butt. And since they don't have as good of activation of their glute, they're not going to be able to produce as much force, they're not going to be as strong in those given activities. Now, our semitendinous, semimembranous, and bicep femoris all are two joint muscles, specifically the long head of the bicep femoris, because they are attaching into our hip and then into our tibia. So that's going to allow not just for knee flexion, which we're gonna to get to in a bit, but also for hip extension. And so those are the muscles that get things done. Notice how they're naturally gonna be bigger and thicker than our hip flexors. We're usually gonna see, I believe typically for normal function, you wanna see about a three to one ratio between 
our hip extensor strength compared to our hip flexor strength. Now, once again, that's what's helping us get that movement done. Guys, quit climbing the couch. Bahamut, please stop. Thank you. Okay. Now, the key is we're not typically turning on our glute max unless we're making our body move at at least a decent velocity or with a decent amount of aggression, for lack of a better term. You're not really getting a whole lot of glute activity when you're just simply walking on flat ground, especially if you're walking on a treadmill or anything that is flat. But if you're going up a hill, you're sprinting, you're jumping, you're lunging, anything along those lines, is going to go ahead and get that to be active. Now, the hamstrings are going to be working pretty much all the time, and so that's not just helping us keep our postural position, but obviously they're gonna be tuned in whenever we are doing that walking or running. Now, in order to abduct, so that's lifting our leg out to the side, this is being done mostly by our glute medius, with being assisted by our gluteus minimus. So we can see how those are both gonna be on the outside of the iliac crest, glute minimus being much lower into it. Now, the important thing with abduction, aside from being incorporated into normal gait structure, or I'm sorry, gait cycling, is this helps, once again, keep or push the knee out to the side, which is really important because when the knee buckles in, the part, of the knee that's suffering the greatest amount of stress from it is typically your ACL. So what they find is the two muscle groups effectively, or the two muscle actions that you can train that help decrease the risk of tearing an ACL the most is gonna be strengthening the hamstrings and strengthening the glute medius because we can stabilize the knee with the hamstrings and we're gonna do a better job of keeping the knee in proper alignment for force production and absorption, thanks to the strengthening of the glute medius. So, when I was just talking about the effects of the hip abductors, every time you're walking, your hip abductors on your right leg are turning on, so they keep your hip even with the ground. So that way, your pelvis isn't going to naturally drop the second you lift that foot off the ground and cause you to effectively trip. Now, this is a normal part of the gait uh, cycle. Some folks, due to muscle imbalances, muscle weaknesses, uh, neurological disorders, are not going to be able to do that. And that's when you see people having a wild gait because they're literally trying to throw their body weight to the side in order to compensate because those muscles are not able to do their typical role. Now, we then have adduction, and that's going to be pulling our legs together. That's going to be done by a number of adductors. Now, the adductor magnus, longus, and brevis are the ones doing the greatest amount of work. You are getting a certain amount of work from the gracilis, but the gracilis is a very small, very thin muscle in comparison to those other three. And notice, guys, when we're looking at this picture, you can now see a good shot of the tensor fascia latte. You can also see a little bit of where we have our pectineus which is gonna adapt a little bit, but also help with that rotation at the hip. Now, the next component that we're gonna go ahead and talk about is gonna be what's known as the pelvic floor muscles.